So chapter 18 is on the nutritional aspects of dental caries, the causes, prevention, and treatment. Uh, this is arguably the most in, important chapter in this book. Um, that's why we're doing it in the first week, so that as we learn more about some of the components addressed here, we can refer back to it. Um, if you're going to see a lot of nutrition on your board, um, I would say there, there's a very good chance it's going to come from this chapter. There's a couple of other things as we go through that could pop up on boards like vitamin deficiencies, um, but this this chapter right here carries, uh, this is the thing you're going to be talking to your patients about a lot. The learning objectives for this chapter are to explain the role each of the following play in the caries process. The tooth, saliva, food, and plaque biofilm. We're going to discuss the following related to cariogenic foods, as well as cariostatic and non-cariogenic properties of foods. We will list cariogenic food beverages. We're going to list examples of fermentable carbohydrates, potentially increasing risk to dental health, and we will identify foods that stimulate salivary flow. We will suggest food and beverage choices and their timing to reduce the cariogenicity of a patient's diet. We will describe characteristics of foods having non-cariogenic or cariostatic properties. We're gonna talk about what all those words mean. Um, and we're going to provide nutrition education to a patient at risk for dental caries. Okay, so, as I'm sure you can guess by the title of this chapter, your nutrition and your nutritional status plays a very strong role in your oral health. And so there, there have been a lot of studies done as far as how important our diet is in the way that our teeth develop, in the management um, and the, the maintenance of our oral cavity and our, our uh, health there. Um, as far as repairing those hard and soft oral tissues um, and it, they, your nutrition can also lead to unhealthy things like cavities and periodontal disease. And so here we're talking about dental caries. Then we need to understand that dental caries is an oral infectious disease and it's a disease that is multifactorial. It means that a lot of things play a role in getting a cavity. It's transmissible, so if someone has a cavity, they can actually um, pass that bacteria on to other people. And of course, that it is a bacteria, right? That's how we. That's how it's transmitted. Um, there are primary and secondary factors that nutrition plays a role in. So nutrition, nutrition has a topical and it has a systemic effect. One, we put it into our mouth and it affects our mouth that way. And then we swallow that food and we ingest it and we, we absorb certain factors or we don't absorb certain things. And that plays a role in our development of dental caries. And then um, the book goes into how um, dental caries remains the most common chronic childhood disease. And while we might not think that it's too bad, right? Like it's, well, there's just a couple cavities, like it's not a big deal. It is a big deal because getting a, a cavity when you're a kid means that eventually you could get recurrent decay, especially if you don't improve your diet. And then that cavity gets bigger. And then eventually that filling needs to be replaced and then it gets bigger and then you get a crown and, and eventually, you know, you need a root canal or, or um, you know you lose that tooth, and when you start to lose teeth, then your ability to chew food, uh, you you lose that ability, you lose some of that um, you know mastication ability, and so it it leads people down this path of poorer and poorer nutrition. Also, it plays a role in their financial status as well. Getting, um, you know, having to constantly deal with dental concerns is expensive. And so if we can, as dental hygienists, educate our patients early and we can prevent them from having these problems, we're not only going to give them a better chance at being healthy and eating healthy foods later in life, but we are also going to save them a lot of money, which they can then use in you know, their other pursuits in life. Um, some of the barriers for getting those dental care um, as far as coming in to see us are that 
it costs a lot of money, right? Some people don't have insurance, um, and so they have to deal with public programs, and sometimes public programs have, are, are not the best. Um, and then there, there are providers who work in some of those underserved communities, but they are stretched really thin. Um, you know, dent, uh, I've talked about it several times, but dentists go to school, they have to spend a lot of money on student loans. They have to pay those student loans off, you know, so they're not necessarily, every dentist shouldn't be required to give back a certain amount because they, they have to make it back themselves. Um, there is a fear of dentistry. There is a certain amount of vulnerability involved with laying down and letting someone, um, you know, look in your mouth. And then there are difficulties in accessing services. You know, maybe um, they live in a more rural area and so there's not a lot of access to care. And if that's the case, then they're, they're probably not coming in to get a nutritional counseling with their dental hygienist. Um, or they just have a poor awareness of the importance. Um, this one I see most of the time, especially in children, um, the parents think that it's not a big deal, you know, it just, it's just a cavity, like it's okay, everybody gets them. And it's like, it's true, everybody gets them, but they don't have to get them. We don't, not everyone has to have cavities. Um, if we can educate people and we can tell them, you know, look, you know, preventing cavities means preventing all of those other things we talked about, then, you know, they could, they could prevent all of that and, and um, it's only going to help them in the long run. All right, so those major factors in the dental caries process are these four things. So it has to be a combination of factors that there is a susceptible host or tooth surface. There has to be a sufficient quantity of cariogenic microorganisms in the mouth. There has to be the presence of, of fermentable carbohydrates, and there has to be a particular composition or flow of saliva. When one or more of these um, sort of the link, links in this Venn diagram. Um, if one or more of these is, you know, uh, insufficient, then the caries process is is given like that foothold. Um, this works the same way as um, infection control, right? So like first we have to have a susceptible host, we have to have enough of the microorganism, it has to be a viral microorganism, and it has to have some sort of uh, vector, right? So it, it works essentially the same way. You'll see this image here on page 352 in your book. Okay, so first up is the tooth. And a tooth that is well intact, that has a, as in, an intact enamel, is going to be more resistant against that demineralization process, right? And this begins before the tooth even erupts in the mouth. If there is enough um, calcium, phosphorus, vitamin A, C, and D, fluoride, and protein in that child's uh, system, then the tooth will form properly. When any one of those vitamins um, and, and micronutrients are, or the one is a, is a macronutrient, is a protein, um, if any one of those is insufficient, then the tooth will not form to its fullest potential. And you end up seeing some things um, like hypoplasia, um, and the, I mean, your book talks about dental anomalies as well, um, but hypoplasia is the one that you see when, when a child's diet doesn't have um, what it should in order to form those tooth, teeth properly. Um, then deep pits and fissures increase susceptibility. So this isn't something that we can control. Um, it's, you know, it's a genetic thing. And so as the tooth is forming, if it has a deep pit and fissure, then it increases susceptibility. This is the importance of us stepping in and saying, you know, now that their um, permanent molar has erupted, we need to put a sealant on it. And then dental anomalies like macrodontia, which are abnormally large teeth, and enamel hypoplasia, those also play a role in um, plaque retention. So like if someone has abnormally large teeth, then they probably have a lot of overlapping and crowding of their teeth, which kind of creates these little nooks and crannies for the plaque to adhere. And then it makes it difficult for the patient to keep it clean. And so it, it certainly will, um, you know, set that tooth up for, for, uh, for failure. 
Okay, so I think this, this is a funny slide because it says host factors, but these are really important factors. So food selection and dietary patterns, we're certainly going to talk about a lot more as far as the types of foods that the patients are choosing and how they go about eating those foods, um, you know, the order and the frequency and all of that wonderful stuff we're going to talk about. Um, the oral hygiene habits of that individual, so how effective are they at removing that plaque biofilm, how effective are they at um, you know placing those types of preventive um, medicaments the the genetics so that's that you know tooth morphology um, and and you know that person's ability you know, maybe they have a genetic predisposition to uh, have some sort of absorption issue things like that um, race or ethnic group this really plays more of a role in food selection you know race or ethnic group uh, plays a role in like the culture that you grow up in um, it, it uh, to a certain extent, it plays a role in your socioeconomic status, things like that. Um, socioeconomic status is the one at the bottom, although I, I, I think that more often than it should, those two are, are um, associated. And then age, right? So younger people, um, the primary teeth have very thin enamel, so they are a little bit more susceptible, whereas, you know, when, um, when the tooth first erupts, it's probably a little less um, susceptible. And then as people age, obviously there are, there are a lot of factors that go into some of the things they're susceptible to. Okay, so saliva. This picture makes me uh, think about those people who, like as soon as they sit in your chair, you, they can't swallow their own saliva anymore, like it's, it's toxic to them. Um, so saliva is, is pretty essential to you know, preventing cavities. Um, so saliva, the development of those salivary glands begins that fourth week in utero. And if the person, the, you know, the mother and um, I guess it's still an embryo or it's a fetus. I'm not, I'm, I can't remember what week it is that it, it switches. Um, but if they don't have enough vitamin A, iron, and protein, then they're probably not going to develop those salivary glands um, to it, their fullest potential. Um, saliva has a protection for the teeth because of its flow. It needs to have an adequate amount of saliva, which is why we always talk about, um, you know, is the saliva flow normal or is it delayed, right? Because when it's delayed, that plays, that plays a big role in what we need to talk about. Um, and we see that when we see patients who have xerostomia, right? When they have dry mouth, they are at a lot higher of a risk of getting a cavity than someone who has an adequate amount of saliva. Saliva also protects against cavities um, by neutralizing the acid that the biofilm produces, right? And so it essentially will raise that pH level in the mouth, uh, the pH level we're looking for is about a seven. And so uh, the saliva has this bicarbonate, phosphate, and protein, which is how it works to neutralize those acids and then uh, bring the pH back up, right? Um, this, of course, happens every single time you introduce a fermentable carbohydrate or an acidic beverage into your mouth. You have to start this process all over again of the saliva working to, uh, to counterbalance that. And so if you're someone who sips a lot on a beverage, then, you know, it takes time for it to, to reduce that. Um, so the frequency or that duration of that acidic drink, if you extend that frequency or duration, then it's really hard for that saliva to buffer it um, because you know you only have so much of that bicarbonate, phosphate, and protein. And so if you're constantly you know presenting that acidic challenge, then your saliva is is eventually going to to be less effective at that. Um, it's pretty important as well um, that there is an adequate flow of saliva because saliva is that rapid transport of the food from the mouth into um, you know the stomach right as you swallow then your saliva plays a really big role in forming that bolus um, and if you are unable to get that then you're going to have a lot of the food left over in the mouth kind of adhering to some of those. I don't know if some of you guys have seen patients who uh, have xerostomia, but they, they tend to get things like caught up in their vestibules and like they, they get stuff stuck in those embrasures and things are just kind of hanging out in there. There's just food sort of 
pieces. Um, and so if they had more saliva flow, then they, they wouldn't have this problem. You see people with a lot of saliva, they do not have that problem. Um, another thing is that if you eat citrus foods like orange juice and lemonade uh, or grapefruit, things like that, that's going to stimulate saliva to uh, uh, produce, right? That's that's something that, you know, your taste buds taste that and it, it starts that process of saliva, saliva sort of excretion. And it has citric acid content. So even though the citric acid in those citrus foods isn't good for your, your pH level, the citric acid that's in those foods can help to promote saliva. So if you have patients who have xerostomia, recommending um, like citrus sort of, of things that have maybe a xerostomia or something like that with it, you don't want to give them sugar, obviously. Um, but if you're, if you're recommending things like that, that can help to stimulate their saliva. Um, you also have to watch out for erosion whenever you, you recommend citrus. And then because that saliva is saturated with that calcium, phosphate, um, and fluoride ions, they it helps to remineralize the tooth, right? So as the tooth is demineralizing, it's losing its calcium and phosphorus and phosphate, sorry, not phosphorus. And fluoride is sort of uh, attracted to those areas. It bonds, and once fluoride bonds to those areas that are, are uh, less dense, then it then attracts more calcium and phosphate to that area, which is how um, saliva plays that role in, in remineralization along with uh, fluoride. Finally, of course, there is in, uh, immunoglobulin A, uh, which is an antimicrobial element that is in your saliva, and it helps to interfere with that adherence of bacteria. It helps to compete with that bacteria as it attaches to the tooth surface. And then as we know, there's proteins in your saliva which help to form that acquired pellicle. So um, saliva is a, a pretty important aspect. So next up is plaque biofilm. And biofilm is a complex environment that's made up of not only bacteria, but polysaccharides, proteins, and lipids. That's why you create plaque biofilm whenever you put food into your mouth, right? Plaque biofilm, even when you don't put food in your mouth, plaque biofilm starts to form. Um, it forms a barrier um, on the enamel and is meant to uh, interfere with that demineralization. However, when it's there for a long period of time, so it has time to mature, or if fermentable carbohydrates are introduced, then it starts to have a very um, like negative byproducts. And that byproduct of that metabolism of sucrose and glucose is that acid. Then that lowers the pH level, which in turn makes it an even more favorable condition environment for streptococcus mutants. Streptococcus mutans or S mutans is a gram positive anaerobic spherical bacteria, bacterium um, and is widely implicated in initiation of dental caries, according to your book. Um, another like major player in um, cavities is gonna be lactobacillus and together especially they're capable of fermenting carbohydrates they thrive in that acidic environment um, the amylase that is in your saliva which is the enzyme that begins the breakdown of carbohydrates assists in this process as far as breaking down some of those sugars for the uh, bacteria to consume and it begins about two to three minutes after you know the introduction of whatever the food is you know you take a drink or you chew a bite and it can persist for up to hours and how long it lasts really depends on the type of food that you introduce if you introduce something sticky that's going to adhere to the tooth then it's going to last a little longer than maybe um, a, a swig of fruit juice right um, what I really want you to take from this section here is going to be the critical pH level so demineralization of the enamel occurs at the critical pH um, which is 5.5 Five. Those are terrible. Um, 
that is the pH level in which demineralization of enamel is, okay? If, if it stays 5.5 or lower for longer periods of time, then more demineralization will occur. If it stays by, if it's 5.5 and it, you know, very quickly comes back up out of it, then only a small amount of demineralization will occur. The other thing you need to know is the pH level of 6.7. So 5.5 is for enamel, okay? Um, Enamel obviously being, you know, 95 to 98% uh, mineral deposit, right? However, uh, dentin and cementum break down and, and demineralize at 6.7. These two numbers are very important, okay? So that one is enamel, this one is dentin. This is very important because there are lots of foods that are lower than 6.7. And so even if you're eating foods that are not necessarily thought to be acidic, um, they could still be lower than 6.7, like tomatoes and strawberries. And so if you have exposed dentin or cementum, either through, you know, bruxism or through recession or, you know, um, like a broken filling or something like that, then you will demineralize at 6.7. So now we're going to get into the good stuff. Um, we're going to talk about karyogenic foods. Karyogenic, karyo meaning cavity, and genic meaning like originating from, right? Um, so this is basically carbohydrates that are simple. Um, the enzyme that is in your saliva is called amylase right here, and it is meant to break down or begin the process of breaking down complex carbohydrates. However, when we eat foods that have already been broken down, like processed sugars or, you know, simple sugars, then we don't we don't need the help breaking it down, right? It actually hurts us. So the the oral monosaccharides and disaccharides, if you're worried about these words, you can flip back in the book to page 66. You'll see those words explained, or you could just hang out and wait until uh, we get to that chapter on carbohydrates. But they're basically one saccharide, meaning, you know, just one, and two saccharides, meaning two saccharides. Um, and it is basically simple, simpler sugars. Um, monosaccharides and disaccharides are broken down into like glucose and sucrose. Um, sucrose is used in the adherence of S mutants to the dental pellicle, right? So basically the very simple sugar helps the bacteria stick on and then the bacteria causes acid, right? Um, Processed starches, so things that would be a polysaccharide that would, you know, not cause a cavity, but if we over-process them, like instant oatmeal is an example, but also like wheat flour um, in a lot of breads and things like that, those will also, because they've been broken down um, through, you know, like processing, they are simpler and they'll begin that process of breaking down in the mouth through, this is partial hydrolysis. Hydrolysis, of course, meaning just, um, just the process of breaking apart with water, right? Um, and any smaller size in the sugar just means it's easier for it to break down, which means it's going to break down faster in the mouth and, and contribute to this. The main thing I want you to take from, you know, the idea of karyogenic foods is the simpler the sugar, the more karyogenic it is, the more ca cavity causing it will be. Um, there are other factors that play a role in, you know, how karyogenic something is like, you know, does it stick to the teeth or is it just, you know, something that rinses away really easily? So like, um, you know, a simple sugar found in um, like sticky candy is going to be more karyogenic than a, um, a simple sugar found like in a rinse, right? Um, but eat, both of them are, are still simple sugars. So they're more causing cavities than like, uh, like, broccoli or a, a raw potato or something that is more starchy. 
Also with that last slide, um, if you look at your book on page 354, uh, you'll see kind of a picture graph of the types of foods that are um, acidogenic, which means they're just um, acid, but they're not necessarily like um, cavity causing. How they they still are cavity causing because they're 5.5, but it's it's a little different. Um, karyogenic means they cause cavities, like cookies and cake and and candy. Um, and then anti-karyogenic, which does not it, it not does it not only not cause cavities, but it can also prevent teeth from karyogenic activity. So milk uh, and cheese and cottage cheese right there, because it has casein in it, um, it has the ability to prevent cavities from being formed. And then um, all the way at the bottom, you see karyostatic or non-karyogenic. So these foods don't cause cavities. Um, and so you can see fruits and vegetables, but the whole fruit and vegetable, obviously not like um, processed, uh, nuts and seeds, butter, oils, um, eggs, and then meat. Um, if you turn one page over to box 18.1, you'll see there's a list there of foods that can cause the pH of plaque biofilm to fall below 5.5. 5.5 being that critical pH that um, is cavity causing on intact enamel. Um, so we're going to get into karyostatic, which um, and, and non-karyogenic properties of foods um, is this slide that we're currently on. Um, it goes over non-nutritive sweeteners, which are like aspartame, saccharin, sucralose, uh, neotame, um, acesulfame, um, and they're not metabolized by microorganisms, so they don't promote caries. So foods that are sweetened with this um, non-nutritive sweetener, like um, you know, uh, sugar substitutes, they don't cause cavities because bacteria can't break them down. Um, it is worth noting, of course, that if you consume too much of this, then it inhibits the way the bacteria works inside the gut and it is not necessarily better. They're sweet, they taste good, um, and they don't cause cavities in the mouth, but they're not necessarily better for your body, which is why, of course, you didn't see them when we talked about you know, the guidelines for nutrition in the last chapter, right? Um, proteins and fats, things like meat, seafood, poultry, eggs, nuts, seeds, margarine, and oils, they are considered karyostatic, which means they sort of hold the pH where it where it is. They don't lower the pH. Um, and so those foods, if you eat them in conjunction with fermentable carbohydrates or you eat them after you eat a fermentable carbohydrate, then they can help to sort of balance out that pH level. All right, so the anti-karyogenic properties of those foods, um, anti-karyogenic being any food or beverage that does not cause a reduction in the pH below 5.5, and therefore, because it doesn't do that, it can protect teeth from that karyogenic activity. Um, so first up is sugar alcohols, which this is uh, like mannitol or sorbitol, and they can protect teeth by decreasing demineralization, they enhance remineralization, or they increase salivary flow. Um, mostly you'll see them uh, called sugar alcohols, right? Not like, not like alcoholic um, beverages with sugar. No, totally different. Um, they're viable alternatives to sugar because they taste really good, but uh, they're not karyogenic. So it, it can help to increase the salivary pH, um, but still uh, promoting saliva production and um, you know buffering some of that uh, carbohydrate issues. Um, and so uh, one of the other ones that, that uh, is actually found naturally in plants and has a ton of studies on it is going to be xylitol right there, that Z-Y-L-I-T-O-L. And xylitol is is uh, equal to or even sweeter than sucrose. Um, it's anti-karyogenic because the oral flora, which I think is funny, they like say it different every time, the bacteria that is in the mouth, um, it doesn't have the enzyme needed to break down xylitol. So it completely just sort of 
blocks the bacteria from, from doing anything. Um, therefore, sal uh, salivary pH doesn't dro drop below 5.5. Um, they put uh, xylitol in chewing gums. They put it in mints and candies. Um, I've seen some rinses with xylitol. And it's, it's really a great thing um, because also it uh, inhibits S mutans ability to uh, attach to the tooth surface. Um, it, I mean, it's wonderful because, you know, not only is it going to have patients chewing on things for longer, like if it's in a gum or it's in, in a food, um, it people are going to be chewing that food and that mastication does help to remove some of that plaque biofilm. Um, and then it also helps to increase some of that salivary flow as well. Um, so the FDA recognizes those sugar alcohols. You can see that list there um, on 355. Um, and they get, when they have one of these ingredients, they get to say things like um, how the non-carriogenic carbohydrate sweetener is present, does not promote, or it may reduce the risk of, or it's useful in not promoting, or um, you know any of those things about dental caries. So if it has any of these ingredients, they get to put things like that on the label and that's important because, you know, we want to talk to our patients about uh, when they're choosing products, they we want them to choose a product that says something like this so that, you know, they're avoiding some of those uh, karyogenic foods. Uh, the next thing on this list is phosphorus and calcium. So phosphorus and calcium is a part of what is in your saliva that helps to buffer that plaque B, uh, pH levels. Um, and so it, it basically stops that demineralization process. Um, your book talks about protein, uh, which especially the principal protein that's in milk, it's called casein, um, and the minerals phosphorus and calcium, those are all anti-karyogenic, where they all prevent cavities, right? Uh, they don't cause cavities. Um, you see them a lot in cheese and milk. So uh, right here on, on 354, you can see that cheese and milk there in the middle. Um, that one is specifically sort of uh, positioned to stop that process of uh, demineralization. And um, it can be like if you you have cookies, right, cookies with milk sort of thing, um, then it can uh, stop that process of demineralization when you eat those foods. Um, even though I, I know somebody thinks of like lactose, right? Lactose is that natural milk sugar. Um, because it comes with casein balanced with it, it, when like drank, it doesn't have enough time to combat the casein and you know the demineralization process so it doesn't have that harmful effect however we always hear of like that um baby bottle uh carries like where kids are put to bed with a bottle of milk right that milk if it just sits it will start to ferment so if it's left for a long period of time um milk is not a good thing when it's kind of uh used correctly then it can have a, a, a positive effect all right. Also, um, so there is a part of um, cocoa, like the they're calling it the cocoa factor. Um, it's also anti-karyogenic in this Vipolm study that they did. Uh, I think it's really funny if you if you read, they say that um, it the results from it indicated a slightly lowers caries incident in individuals consuming chocolate, um, but both of these people are consuming candy, there's just a slightly less karyogenic property in chocolate candy, which I, I, I think is kind of a stretch. Um, they also, the active ingredient in licorice, I'm not even going to attempt to say that, um, is also anti-karyogenic. However, when you read your book, um, it says that it can, uh, it, it's contraindicated with some hypertensive uh, medications. It has a staining capability and can cause sodium retention and increased blood pressure. So, um, you know, I don't know if I would recommend licorice. Um, and then grapefruit and obviously other citrus uh, things, they promote saliva production, but they're pretty acidic, so they lower the pH level. So, you know, you, you gotta be careful when you, when you recommend things like that. 
Uh, your book also talks about, there's a lot of new research now about cranberries, tea, coffee, wine, and probiotics. We're going to get into probiotics when we get to chapter three next week. Um, but for now, just, you know, probiotics are, are a wonderful, uh, beneficial thing to the host. Here's that picture from uh, page 354 that I was talking about. These dental hygiene considerations are from the dental considerations box on your uh, in your book on page 356. Um, if I were you, I would I would read through these. This slide just gives you uh, kind of the top five, but. Um, um, these boxes in this book are really important. They give a lot of the information and they, they kind of do it in a really uh, succinct way. So um, your quizzes and things like that, if it's not something I expressly said in a chapter um, or in one of these lectures, uh, will probably come from a box. So I, I would read the boxes. But um, as far as this goes, you want to encourage really meticulous oral self-care. Um, and you know, recommend to your patients that they come back frequently in order to um, just keep track of their dental caries and, and uh, um, you know, watch that kind of thing. We want to promote sealants for those deep pits and fissures, right? We want to make the tooth less susceptible. Um, for high risk patients, we want to encourage the use of chlorhexidine, which has been shown for the antimicrobial effect, fluoride, which has that remineralization process, and xylitol, which also has a really good uh, uh, rate. And then a lot of your patients who are more homeopathic, they might be more inclined to use xylitol if fluoride is something that they're not comfortable with. Uh, we're going to encourage healthy eating habits with minimal fermentable carbohydrate intake between meals. Um, we'll talk about this in a bit, but how often you eat food is, uh, is just as important. And then eating low-fat cheese as a snack or at the end of the meal could provide anti-carogenic effects. So some of those other factors that influence um, how cavity-causing the food is, um, is going to be the frequency of how often you eat meals and snacks. Um, if you're someone who eats three times a day or you're someone who eats, you know, 10 times a day is going to play a role. The oral retentiveness of foods. So again, how sticky and, and uh, how much it uh, retains to the tooth. Um, the sequence of the food consumption. So for instance, you know, if you have something like a fermentable carbohydrate and then you follow it up with something that is anti-cariogenic, then you're going to reduce the risk of getting cavities. But if you eat something anti-cariogenic and then you follow it up with something cariogenic, then you're going to be more likely to get, to get cavities. Um, the amount of the fermentable carbohydrate consumed, this is a, it plays a role, um, but it, it plays like kind of a lower role. Um, the sugar concentration of the food or drink item. So again, like how simple is that sugar and how much sugar is there? The physical form of the carbohydrate. So, you know, does it, um, does it, is it something that you chew or is it something that you drink? And the proximity of eating to bedtime. Um, so this one is, is more so like people who eat after they brush at night. Um, they, you know, go to bed and the, the plaque is sort of just retained. So how quickly a cariogenic food is cleared from the mouth is a factor that relates to that caries development. Um, if you're eating something that is sticky and retentive carbohydrate, like a, a fruit snack, it's going to stay in contact with the enamel for a lot longer than like a sports drink or a soda would. Um, the slower oral clearance of fermentable carbohydrates means a longer exposure of the tooth to that acid attack. Carbohydrates that are more chewy, like, I mean, the fruit snack is somewhat chewy, but not incredibly, right? Something that makes you really work to chew is, while yes, it's still a fermentable carbohydrate, it's going to promote uh, saliva. And so, the saliva is going to wash it away and it's going to be less damaging than something that you don't have to chew very much, but that sticks really good, like uh, like crackers and cookies, things you don't have to chew very much that kind of stick to food really, uh, or stick to your teeth really good, um, 
uh, like Oreos, right? Like everybody knows about how Oreos get caught in like all the nooks and crannies. Um, but it isn't, it isn't very difficult to chew up Oreos in comparison to the book uses uh, caramel. If you're chewing up like a, a caramel, then you're going to be you're going to be chewing on it for a while. That's going to promote that mastication and it's going to promote saliva. And so that's going to reduce that. Um, even though the sugar might, or the caramel might be higher in sugar than like a pretzel or something like that, how long it stays on your teeth is important. Okay, we have finally arrived to the most important slide of this chapter, and it is frequency, okay? F the frequency of how often you uh, introduce something into your oral cavity is going to play the biggest role in ca uh, cavity causing activity. Um, there is a linear relationship. It means when one goes up, the other goes up, right? It's a linear relationship between caries rate and the number of meals and or snacks consumed. Um, so every single time a food containing those carbohydrates are eat, is eaten, the salivary pH level drops below that critical level for about 40 minutes. There's a lot of science done. Every time you do it, 40 minutes it takes for your saliva to bring that pH level back up to normal. Then enamel demineralization is occurring that whole 40 minutes. Acid exposure is additive throughout the day. It means that if you have 40 minutes here, 40 minutes there, then you now have 80 minutes, right? Eventually, demineralization progresses to the point at which decay may be detected clinically. So the enamel is either always, it's either breaking down, it's either demineralizing or it's remineralizing. There's no in between. It either it's getting better or it's getting worse, depending on, on you know what you've put in your mouth within the last 40 minutes. The calcium and phosphorus that's in saliva needs time to remineralize that tooth between meals and snacks. You can help your saliva in this way by either eating something that is non-cariogenic, something that's anti-cariogenic. After you eat something cariogenic, you can help it. You can help your saliva by maybe rinsing with water after you eat something that has a little bit um, of a, a physical form that sticks, right? That more um, retentive type of carbohydrate. Um, but usually if you introduce it, you're there for 40 minutes. The timing and the sequence is also going to play a role. And so the amount of acid is going to be reduced if the fermentable carbohydrate is eaten before or between other non-cariogenic foods. Just like we talked about, if you eat something cariogenic, you follow it up with something non-cariogenic or something anti-cariogenic, then it's going to reduce that time. It's not going to completely get rid of it, but it's going to reduce it. Things like dairy products, like cheese, can reduce the demineralization process of the tooth and can help to buffer those acids that are produced by the bacteria. So um, it will help to you know, raise the pH level, but it's also going to help your um, saliva do its work. Um, the sialagogue, I think sialagogue, your book is so extra by having that word there, um, is that sialagogue is just anything that stimulates saliva. Um, so like a sugar-free chewing gum is going to also promote that buffering of those acids because of how amazing saliva is. Um, and it's going to help to aid in that oral clearance. So not only is saliva helping to you know raise the pH level, it's also helping you to uh, rinse away that food. So when we're thinking about our dental hygiene considerations, um, as far as trying to talk to our patients about cariogenicity, um, we need to review their diet history for patterns of fermentable carbohydrate consumption, frequency, and form. So just for instance, I drink an energy drink. I, I typically drink a sugar-free energy drink, just in case all y'all are wondering. And I drink one pretty much every day. I sip, so that means that it takes me probably four me hours or so to actually consume the thing. Um, so for me, my fermentable carbohydrate, um, now it's it's not the same, like it's not a sugar, but it is acidic, right? It's an acidogenic 
food. And so it is lowering my pH level below 6.7 for sure, but also potentially below 5.5. Um, the frequency for it is I take a sip, I probably would once an hour or so. Um, and so I spend about five hours a day in an acidic challenge with my energy drink. And the form obviously comes in liquid. It means it's less, uh, it's less cariogenic than if I guess I were eating uh, an energy gel once an hour. Um, we are going to recommend that our patients consume fermentable carbohydrates with a meal or eat it with a non-cariogenic food at the end. So for me, um, you know, I don't typically eat a lot of breakfast. Sometimes I do, but not all the time. Um, and so that doesn't work for me, right? I, I don't, I don't eat breakfast. So that's another strike against me. Um, we're going to recommend that our patients eat low uh, non-cariogenic snacks like raw fruits and vegetables, low-fat cheese, milk and yogurt, nuts, popcorn seeds, uh, pizza and tacos, I think is an interesting one after all of those other foods. Um, so for me, I, eat, I do eat a lot of uh, like fruits and veggies. I eat um, nuts and seeds um, and I eat like rice and stuff like that. Um, and so if you look in your book on page 357 in box 18.2, right there it has snacks that promote little or no black acid. So all of those foods are going to be good sources of foods to recommend to our patients to eat as, um, as a snack. However, I want you to be very careful when you recommend some of these foods that are high in fat. So um, like some of the meats, like red meats, um, are like anything that isn't considered a lean meat, right? Uh, we don't wanna necessarily recommend our patients eat a lot of that because of its um, risk of heart disease and, and diabetes, right? And then we don't wanna recommend our patients eat more butter or more margarine or more oil. People are usually eating enough of that. So. Um, what we do want is to say, hey, you know, eat whatever it is you want. You know, if you're going to have a cake, eat it, but then also eat maybe some nuts after or something like that. Um, and we want to encourage limiting of soft drinks and sports energy drinks. So, uh, you know, by all means, you want to tell your patient, hey, that's not good for you. If you keep doing it, uh, Miss Duncan, you know, you're, you're probably going to have some uh, demineralization happening. And I'm like, you know what? You're absolutely right. So the dental hygiene care plan, this starts on page 358, kind of down at the bottom. Um, again, we've kind of skipped over a lot of these boxes that have like dental considerations and nutritional directions, things like that. Those have the best information in them. So please, please, if you if you want to pass this class, please read these boxes, okay? Because these these are they're they're just the best. Um, so the first step in your, your dental hygiene care plan is going to be the assessment. Um, I think it's funny, anthropometric, uh, again, your book is just being extra. This is height and weight measurements. Um, the clinical signs are like, um, you know, like what you're seeing, are they grinding their teeth, things like that. Dental and dietary assessments, um, health and dental history and laboratory data have to be considered. Um, so we're, we're looking at all of these things. Um, and in, in addition to this, we really need to take into account our patient's learning style, their literacy level, their cultural heritage, and their socioeconomic status. So if your patient is uh, very intelligent, you know, your patient's like a doctor of some kind, then I probably wouldn't give them the same type of information as I would give um, a 10 year old, right? We, we want to individualize our recommendations for the person and give it to them at their level. Um, we want to talk about their learning style. Some people work really well with like charts and graphs and other people work really well with, uh, you know, with maybe written literature. It just depends on the person. And uh, though it's okay to ask like, you know, how do you want me to give you this information? I've got a couple different sources. Um, the other thing is um, like cultural heritage really plays more of a role in like the individual's uh, beliefs. And so, um, 
again, like if you had me in your chair and you know that I don't eat animal, like I, I don't eat milk, I, I, I don't eat dairy, um, then recommending for me to eat cheese between all of my meals is, is probably not going to work for me. Um, and so if you ask those kinds of questions, hey, do you eat dairy? Then they say no, then don't recommend dairy by all means. Like there are other foods that you can recommend. They might not be, you know, the, rec the, the choice that you would go with, but it's, you need to make your recommendations individual for the person so that we can get them to do it. Um, so in that first step, we need to identify disease indicators, right? That's what we just figured out because of our assessment. Um, and our carries risk management um, is going to be on page 359. I have a picture of it on the slide, um, but you guys have seen this thing before. And so we're, we're looking at all of those factors about our patient when we are determining their caries risk. And what I really love about this is this also turns into your stuff from radiology, right? So when we look at how often does a patient need to take x-rays, well, what's their caries risk like? And, and so for me, if you're asking me, you know, how often should I take x-rays on my patients, I'm going to ask you, were they low, medium, or high risk on their camera? Because this is how we get a good understanding of how often they need x-rays. And this is how we get a good understanding of what kind of information are we supposed to be giving them. So I know you guys are seeing this in like all of your classes, um, but it's, you know, it's here again because it's, it's just a, such a useful tool. So we wanna identify those disease risk uh, indicators, our caries risk factors, and our caries protective factors as well. So is that person already consuming, you know, um, um, starchy vegetables at every meal? Well, awesome, then, then that's something that we can work with, right? Right? Um, and we need to use our clinical evaluation as well. Here is that form, the CARES Risk Assessment form for everyone six and older. Um, the main difference between this one and the one for zero to six years old is that this one includes identification of medications that are associated with xerostomia, while the one for uh, zero to six is really more honed in on acid exposure that is associated with those childhood CARES, like, um, you know, sippy cups and uh, juice in bottles and things like that. It's, it's really not a good idea to ask, you know, a 25 year old if, uh, if they have juice in their sippy cup. So here is that kiddo uh, one, the zero to six years old. Um, as you can see, these were not very friendly to uh, paste into this slide, but um, you have a very large image of this on page 361 in your book. Okay, so the second step is to take a lot of that information that you just got, and you're going to create and implement a treatment plan of action based on whatever it told you, right? So we filled out the camera, and if we, uh, it's, it, it's color-coded is what your book wants to tell me to tell you. Um, so green is like, good that's what green uh, kind of always stands for uh, moderate risk is yellow and high risk is is red so if your patient falls into moderate or high risk then it's time to start gathering some more information about that patient right we need to get more detail about them um, and we need to understand a little bit more about things um, that they're doing that maybe they're not quite conscious of and so here what we're going to ask them to do is take a food diary and i'm going to show you how that works you guys are going to be doing this on yourself so it's going to be really nice um you're going to be using my plate as a guide to assess the adequacy of the food intake um but all of this obviously of course depends on the cooperation of your patient a lot of times what happens is patients don't realize the things that they eat until they start to keep a diary of what they're eating um, of course they'll you know not eat what uh, they normally do because they know they're writing it down. Um, this is um, this is actually, it's called the Hawthorne effect. Um, it's a study thing that when people know they're being watched, they act differently. But anyway, we're trying to get some kind of idea about the kinds of foods they eat and, and the things that they're really gonna adhere to. Um, also, what, what, what we wanna do, I'm gonna show you a picture of what the food diary is gonna look like, but what we do is we have them write down uh, what they ate and then we have them write down uh, like when they ate it. We'll have them say, you know, where if they went to a restaurant or, or they ate it at home or, you know, maybe they were like in their car. 
um, what it was, how much it was, and how it was prepared, just so we have an idea of, uh, of that food and whether or not it is a fermentable carbohydrate. Then there's a, car a carbohydrate intake analysis worksheet where we go through uh, those fermentable carbohydrates and we break down and we say, is this a fermentable one or is, you know, is this carbohydrate not um, or any of those things. And then we give them that time period. We're going to do the math and say here, you know, at 9 a.m. you drank this and this and you were 40 minutes here. And then at 10 a.m. you did this. You got 40 minutes here. And we're going to break that down for them. And again, two hours of acid exposure is considered high. So for me, I'm in the high range, right? I am, I definitely spend a lot of time um, in that acidic challenge. So here is what that looks like. This person gets up super early at 6 a.m. Um, they go in their kitchen and they eat orange juice, whole wheat bread, diet margarine, I don't know if I've ever heard of that, and an egg. Right, those are the things they ate. They ate, it was a half a cup of orange juice. That seems like a sip. Um, two slices of bread, one tablespoon. Oh, they're putting margarine on their bread. Oh, it's like toast. And then one egg. Um, and then uh, it looks like that the orange juice was unsweetened. That's a good thing, although it does still have its own um, natural sugar. And because it's juice, it, it is a karyogenic item. Um, and then we can see that the, the bread was toasted. That, that really doesn't matter. Um, a tub of uh, of bread. That's interesting. I guess it, you know they just uh, scooped it out, so they didn't they didn't uh, change it at all. And then oh, here it is. The egg was fried in oil. So that's pretty important because I mean an egg is already um, a protein source, so it's um, you know it's not karyogenic. But oil is uh, also not karyogenic, so it's going to help to reduce some of the karyogenic items in this meal because it was consumed in a meal is a little different than if they were just drinking orange juice by themselves. All right, so the next slide of our, our uh, dental hygiene care plan is that now that we have a ton of information about this person, this is where together we need to make goals and. It's you helping them make goals, right? They're not they're not your goals. So, you know, maybe they're spending eight hours a day in an acidic challenge. And and so our goal, it needs to be realistic for that patient. So if they're spending eight hours a day, if it's me and it's my goal, I'm spending maybe five hours a day in an acidic challenge. And so for me, a good goal might be uh, three hours, right? Something that is manageable, something that is realistic. Um, we're not going to say you can never have an energy drink again, right? Because I'd be like, well, I don't really think I'm going to come back to you. Um, so we, they need to be realistic and they need to be made together with the patient. Basically, you help guide the patient make these goals. They're not your goals. Um, they need to be flexible. And they need to meet the patient's needs, preferences, and lifestyle. The education here, uh, I don't know if you guys have read this book. It came out not that long ago. It's called Atomic Habits. It's uh, written by a guy named James Cleary. James Clear, sorry, not Cleary. Atomic Habits. And he goes through how to make a habit, how to make it stick. Um, and there, it's very realistic. It's very well written. Um, if you are interested in uh, behavioral science and trying to get your patients to do what you want them to do and, and you know, changing your habits or anything like that, this is a great goal. Uh, it's a great book. But anyway, um, the education alone does not guarantee behavioral change, right? Because if the patient doesn't care about what you care about, then it's, it's not going to work. You can tell them energy drinks are bad for you, or you can tell me that, and I'm, I'm still going to be like, well they're good um so the assessment and goals are the basis for any recommendations right so we we take a look at whatever you know is going on we say hey you're drinking energy drinks for five hours a day uh you know our goal is to spend three hours a day doing that instead and so then our education is more so like, you know, this is why you can do this. You know, maybe at this point in your day, you do this other thing instead of setting it down and coming back to it later. Um, we're going to dispel myths, redirect inappropriate habits, and provide new ideas. So you want to introduce new concepts to your patients. You want to talk to them about realistic things. So, you know, maybe there's someone who... Um, dips tobacco and we want them to stop doing that um, we're not going to you know say 
that you know it makes hair grow or or any of those random things right patients have have really funny ideas you'll find that a lot of patients have um really interesting ideas like old wives tales and things like that 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 don't make any sense to you and you've never heard of before um and they have value because the patient believes it, right? Or, or maybe they're afraid that it might be true, um, but it's your job to tell them the science behind things and then to redirect inappropriate habits. So you might be like, hey, you can't drink energy drinks for five hours a day. That's, re that's unrealistic, you know? Just drink the dang thing. Um, and then we're gonna provide new ideas. So you can be like, hey, instead of energy drinks, why don't you try tea or something like that, right? And um, that is the end of fermentable carbohydrates. Uh, that's the end of week one. So if you have any questions, um, feel free to send me an email. Um, if something doesn't make sense, um, please, please ask. Um, we are going to go over these two chapters for uh, quiz one, which is going to be next week on Friday. We're going to start at 8 a.m. Um, so if you want to log in like around 7.45 or 7.50, I would greatly appreciate that. So uh, we can all start on time. Um, it is going to be proctored, so you'll log in. Make sure you know you have your phone, camera sort of thing set up, um, and you'll have it facing you at your computer or your laptop. I need to be able to see um, your head and your laptop like screen, right? So you kind of have it like off to the side, but behind you. Um, and um, yeah, so if you have questions, email me. Thanks.